than ever it's the unofficial 40 from soonerscoop.com now here's the entire sooner scoop crew carrie josh eddie and bob all right welcome back it is another edition of the unofficial 40 it is the cheese it bowl edition of the unofficial 40 as uh eddie radosovich and bob presbillo have uh they're there. They are there. Southwest could not stop them. Well, they actually did stop them from getting there. Uh, and they had to get a rental car from Atlanta and drive like it was supposed to be six hours. It ended up being nine hours because of traffic. And the world has lost its collective mind. Uh, I'm Kerry Murdoch, joined by uh, Eddie Radosevich and Bob Prisbillo from Orlando. Josh McQuiston is with us. He will be in Orlando coming up, maybe, possibly. We don't know if Eddie and Bob are ever going to be able to come home. But there is a bowl game tomorrow night. At the Cheez-It Bowl, all the media has been done. And gentlemen, welcome into another podcast that I forgot to record in the beginning. Hey, the the good news is, folks, we only made it in like 10 minutes. So I I, I feel like that's halfway a win. But yes, uh, (laughs) the media responsibilities are done for, uh, I guess, leading up to the bowl game. Had the joint press conference today it's been pretty low-key bob i you know like we went out to practice yesterday a few minutes to an hour to uh drake and Braden willis a little bit of news on uh, the drake stoops front with with him returning for 2023 but uh we'll see i mean though it doesn't feel like this is going to be much of a game on thursday night but uh you know it it kind of is what it is it feels a little flipped from last year where you sort of thought with Caleb Williams staying at quarterback, Oregon didn't stand a chance. And that's exactly how that game played out. It kind of, it feels like OU is the one that doesn't really have a shot at, at whatever it's going to try to accomplish Thursday. And it's just more about make sure no one gets seriously hurt and let's see what some of those young guys can do. I think it would have been a bad matchup with Oklahoma not having three offensive linemen out with them having Eric Gray with them having Jalen Redmond uh you take a bunch of those guys out in the offensive firepower it's going to be interesting to see what they uh what kind of run game they're going to be able to produce with Javante Barnes getting a load of the carries and are we going to see Gavin Sawchuk I know that we've talked about the uh the younger guys within the program getting certainly a big opportunity going into 2023 and you know it's it's definitely not the uh end all be all that they walk out of here with a win, but they're going to be playing. And then what will probably be 90% Florida state fans. Uh, it's, you know, they've de- definitely embraced the moniker of kind of being the underdog that nobody thinks are going to have much of a chance come uh, Thursday night. Here's something for you. Do you think that we will have a pretty good understanding of who's coming back and who is not by how much they feature a certain player uh, offensively? Like, if they go out there and, and just try and get Braden Willis as many catches as possible, wouldn't that kind of signal that they're cool with Marvin Mims and he's coming back and Dylan Gabriel's coming back and uh, we all know Drake's coming back. But I, I think that's going to be something kind of interesting to watch. And maybe even with that, that offensive line and some of those youngsters, how many of those guys play to where Bill Bedenboe's kind of sending a message like, okay, next year's your year. I just don't know if they're, I mean, are you going to like, quote unquote, bench a Chris Murray? So, uh, so somebody like a, uh, or Savion uh, Bird. Uh, yeah. Savion. So, so Savion Maybe not Bird bench, but, but play them, like, play them more. I see that. Yeah. I'm not talking about benching, but just getting them more in the rotation. Are they do that though. If you're trying to chase points. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think it's, I think I, it's going to be. I would love be... to say that I, that it, there would be an opportunity for that to happen. I think it's going to be more interesting, most likely, just seeing if they decide to take certain people out, you know, if, you know, at halftime or something like that. Like, yeah. don't play Marvin Mims after halftime because, you know. What What I'm wondering about is how Jeff Jeff Levy goes about it. Do you try to just shorten this game and make it quick and painless? Or does he try to have some fun and be very free, do a lot of trick plays, and see if you can create some fireworks? Like, is, or is it just going to... Let's be vanilla. Let's just get through it. We know we don't we don't have our pieces. Let's call as basic a plan as possible with some new players and see if they can do it. 
Or did he just say, you know what, no one expects us to do anything here. Let's go out and have some fun. It better not be I mean, be if vanilla. it's the former and they just go out there with a plain – if they go out there with a plain offense and just try to get through, they fire every fucking person on <laughs> – seriously. That would be the most offensive thing that you could possibly do to a bunch of uh, seniors like a Braden Willis is just go out there and know that you're going to get your ass kicked. Yeah, you would hope that well, they just I mean, let it done loose. It once this year already. They did it against Texas, exactly. Like we know that this. Yeah, is but Dylan Gabriel was dead. Yeah, with Dylan they Gabriel, they literally they'd... shoot every person on the staff if that happens. No, I don't. I, I mean, I hope that they just air it out and just you know do some crazy shit and all that. I mean, it's a four thirty game. I mean, it's it needs some eyeballs attention. You might as well make it a shootout if you can, because. Florida State's going to score some I, I points. I think that that's what they would try to do. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have. They're going to obviously going to have to score some points. I mean, I don't think that Oklahoma's going to be able to slow down Jordan Travis and the Florida State offense. If you're going to win this game, you have to. I guess the like, perfect recipe would be forcing a couple turnovers somehow, and you got to capitalize every time that Florida State. It, I mean, it's the classic like underdog uh, game plan. You got to be able to take advantage of every opportunity. Unfortunately for Oklahoma, every time that that's happened this year, they haven't been able to do that. I just don't know why it would all of a sudden come to uh, come together. You know, it was interesting out there uh, this week, and and you know, the, they had four guys that are early enrollees, and they were able to come out and practice. Uh, and you wrote about this, Bob, but uh, those guys came out and practice. They invited, Britt invited everyone, but there are some guys that didn't want to come out because that would have made them ineligible for some of the all-star. Like a Jackson Arnold couldn't come out. Exactly. Even, couldn't come out because then he couldn't be in the the uh, Under Armour Amer- All-American game. I know. It's like you're asking them enough to skip their senior semester of high school to show up early. Then Now you've taken them away from the Under Armour or the All-American Bowl in San Antonio. And I like that he clarified that because I – I think there had been some people wondering, you know, well, why these four? You know, it wasn't based on location. It wasn't like they were all like, kids in Florida, so it made sense. Like, oh, all right, well, if you're in an all-star game, but you go to these bowl practices, then you're not eligible to participate. Okay, that makes a lot more sense as to why this was the group of four that showed up. And it was it's funny to think, like, Derek LeBlanc and how much of a, like, beast he looks like on high, on high school film. And you see him at practice, and you get an idea of, like, that's the type of steps, that type of conditioning and improvement he's going to have to make to try to become a defensive tackle for OU. It's like it's not just going to happen overnight. No matter how good this recruiting class seems like it's going to be, there's still going to be steps along the way that everyone's going to have to take before they can be – who OU needs them to be like now? Well, and like it, it, it kind of goes back it's to kinda... it kind of goes back to spring for me uh, when you saw some of those guys like Kobe McKenzie and you know you're like, well, that's a big guy for a freshman, but he's still, you know, he's kind of got extra weight. Yeah. You know, he's not cut. Like when I saw him out there in the bowl prep practices, looked like a much more refined, you know, just player body body type. Like he looked like he belonged because I was like. He was wearing number four because he was doing scout team stuff. And I think I went up to you, Eddie, and I was like, that's Kobe McKenzie, right? And you're like, uh, you're like, yeah, that is. Like he, Not that it was a big transformation, but it was enough of a transformation to say, like, okay, he looks like a college football player now. It, it kind of reminded me in, like, basically about LeBlanc, uh, like, Bob just kind of about. It reminds me of when we go to those rivals camps and we see a kid that is a really good looking body and you go, well, if he's like a freshman or a sophomore, he might <laughs> end up yep. being somebody. It kind of reminds me of that. Like you just know that the, those guys are going to go through those body transformations over the next, you know, six months to a year. And uh, he looks different than say, and I'm not picking on a guy. It's just like a, a Jordan Kelly, like long armed. It, it looks like a, somebody that, uh, you know, could 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 be a somebody when when they're when he's all said and done when he goes through uh, a full year of Jerry Schmidt and, and kind of transforming his body into what you would expect a uh, a college football player to look like. 
So, I mean, outside of that, I mean, was it kind of the same thing seeing, you know, the bowl prep practices as much as it was seeing the, the cheese at practices? Like, you could just tell that these guys are down a lot of people. Yeah, they're down a lot of people, but it was good to confirm and see, like, they're not down anyone else. They didn't, like, no one got here and then yeah. got hurt. You know, there's still, you're missing Major and Andrew Rame and Shane Witter and Jaden Rowe, Calvin Gilliam. You know, like, you're missing all those pieces that weren't even the, in the in the portal. But at least when you got to Florida, you didn't all of a sudden just lose a cup, you know, a couple others trying trying to go through these practices. I will say, I, I you know, all things considered, uh, you know, and the way that the season went, and just kind of talking to the guys afterwards and seeing how they interact and all that kind of stuff. It does seem like it's like, I, I think that I don't know about a news on life or anything like that, but it does seem like, uh, you know, at the very least that, and it, I guess it kind of goes on par with everything that we've heard this throughout this season. They, they really do enjoy being around each other. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe they go out there and, uh, and kind of put it all together tomorrow night. I, just, I, just, I find it hard to believe that I'll have to see it to believe it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I got to say, uh, you know, Eddie and Bob are broadcasting from uh, their hotel in Orlando. Uh, and, you know, it's not a perfect connection, but Eddie, it really does sound like you are just surrounded in a room full of cocaine. <laughs> because it like slows down and then speeds up and you just seem I like wish. it just seems like you are. You, you're it's out of your mind me. right now. Okay, no. I've been hearing that with Eddie the whole time. I'm like, what's going on? I don't know. I, I have no idea. Maybe so, Southwest uh, Airlines is trying to, uh, to really f*** me over after kind of f***ing us over. Well, we talked about that in the pod that wasn't. Uh, you guys, you know, you were, you were fortunate. You, and it's weird to say this, but oh, yeah. there was a... There was a whole thing that happened uh, when you guys got to the airport, and what did you tell me that your uh, your 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 train your your uh, trolley guy told you? Oh, like when he the the guy that picked me up, and I had all these bags, and I, I took the shuttle to get into the uh, terminal, into like the front gates, and um, he picked me up and was like, you know, he he'll ask like. Where'd you park? And yeah, I'm what like, airport? You know, road, whatever. What, what airport? Yeah. He gives me the. Uh, yeah, in Oklahoma City, and he gives me the uh, the little thing. He's like, "All right, what uh, airline?" And I said Southwest, and he just started laughing. and was like, "Oh boy, you're in for it." And I I, I kind of knew that like that was the beginning of what had been obviously a uh, social media buzz with Southwest and flights being canceled and pushed back. And this is on top of our flight already being pushed back for three hours. So we kind of knew what we were getting into, and you know, it eventually just got to the point where. You know, I had called you on the way out. Bob had called me and it was kind of a, you know, what the hell are we going to do? And it ultimately got to the point where it was like, we either need to get on this plane right now <laughs> and kind of know that we're going to be stuck in Atlanta at some point or uh, try, again try and hold off and, yeah. and get, yeah, get in Wednesday. And, you know, I, I think we made the right decision. It sucked at the time. We ended up driving from Atlanta down to uh, Orlando in a rental car, but uh, it kind of is what it is. All things considered, we got all of our bags. Uh, we have all of our equipment here. It just, uh, I don't know. It was, uh, it was an event that we, uh, we survived and we're going to be able to, uh, to tell tales about, uh, at some point. It's kind of fun. Well, and it was one, one day we'll laugh. Just, just not yet. It was also, right. it was one of those things where I was trying to help you guys as much as I could. And Eddie, you and I were talking and, and, uh, I was like, Concern. I was because there was a question like, should we get on this flight that, it, that apparently is going right. to take off, not knowing if we're going to make our connection in Atlanta. Uh, and so I think we decided we found out it was so bad and there were so many flights being canceled that we just needed to get you as close to Orlando as possible. Yet, yeah, I didn't know how you guys felt about any any kind of he rallied the troops. He's like, yes, let's get on this fucking plane. Let's just go. Let's get as, as close to Orlando as we can. Meanwhile, I said, well, what's Bob doing right now? And Eddie was like, I don't know. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? He's like, he's just standing over there. And I, I was really concerned that Bob was just going to be like, no, nope, f*** it, I'm not going. <laughs> the, reason, the reason I could do that is because I didn't bring any checked bags. So I was going to hold, I was going to, how long can I stay in this line 
before I need to get through security and a TSA pre-check. So I was like, I can go in this line a lot longer than anyone else because once I decide to go, it's only going to take me a couple minutes. Yeah, I, I really was that, concerned at one point that Bob was no longer going to be working for us, that he was just going to throw his hands up and say, yeah, <laughs> this shit. So I was like, I, I'm out of here. Like This line's starting to move because people are going to the, self, the, the, the self-serve. Can I get to talk to an agent? Before I need to start boarding, and and it was so it, it was so didn't messed quite up. Get there. It was so messed up because you guys were getting to Atlanta, and like I was driving back from my my parents' place in Frisco, and you know I was every thirty minutes I was refreshing the flight track or the flight list, and no it, doubt. It, and it kept like the Oklahoma City flight would get pushed back, but so would the Atlanta flight. So they were still matching up to where you'd have like forty minutes, and they were in the same gate. But then all of right. a sudden, I get to, like, Paul's Valley, and the Atlanta flight moved up, like, two hours. And so there was – you weren't going to land before that plane took off. And then we started having to make hard decisions. I thought, well, I'll find him a hotel. And uh, so then I started looking at hotels in Atlanta, and it showed that there were hotels, but people were buying them so fast. Uh, and this was, like, 1145 at night. So it's like I'm up against it because at midnight I can't book anything online for that night. So I'm scrambling. I'm noticing that every damn hotel is out in Atlanta that's even 25 miles close to the airport. And so then I think the next logical thing is book a car, get a car. And so I, I actually did that before I gave up on the hotels, thinking that you guys would be able to get a night's sleep and I'd get you a, a rental at 8 a.m. and then you'd be able to drive. Well, it turns out you couldn't get a hotel, so you had to. You basically became Tom Hanks in that movie uh, where he lived in the airport. The terminal. The yes. terminal. Yes. Yep. Just slept slept on the floor for a little bit, like thirty minutes at a time. Wake up, walk walk around. And Glorious. so, and so, what happened Glorious. was, I I rented with Hertz because they had cars, and I and I figured they're not going to have cars online if they don't really have them. And, like, it was great because, you know, people were – I was telling people about it online, and they were giving me suggestions, and people were like, hey, the the Avis counter is a 24-hour counter. And so I call Eddie, and I'm like, hey, Eddie, the Avis counter is a 24-hour counter. And he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, there's a, <laughs> there's a huge line. That's a special circle of hell that I want nothing to do with right now. Yeah. Uh, it, there was, like, a – the only thing that I like truly was worried about from a sleeping standpoint at the airport was I was going to wake up to some, and maybe this is like the most American thought ever, wake up to someone that just had finally had enough and had decided to bring a gun up to the airport and end everybody's life. Well, you, you, I mean, you were fortunate because you were able to get your bag uh, that you had checked in Atlanta. Like, I can't imagine that that was a pretty scene down by baggage claim. It's a it's a complete disaster. I went over there and was helping Ryan Aber, who they got stuck. Him and Jesse Crittenden from the Norm Transcript got stuck in St. Louis, and they actually drove from St. Louis to Orlando. And so I went over there yesterday when I took the rental car back to help them try to find Ryan Aber's bag. And like just looking at the scene and the people's faces, like there was this one lady. Uh, uh, they live in Orlando. They got back on I want to say Sunday. They got back to Orlando, to where they live, and they had been up there the last three days trying to get their bags that are in the airport, and they had not been able to get them yet because nobody knew where they were. But the bags were in the airport somewhere. Like I, <laughs> the, the amount of incompetence on part of uh, Southwest this week has been kind of glorious. Like if, if you can find humor in the, uh, uh, the darkness, that – it, 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 it's just incompetent. They're, it's an incompetent company right now. By the way, I want to get back to this. I want to, I want to say this, though. Um, I know a lot of you have been you know, spending, uh, some of you, if you haven't been on Southwest, uh, have been spending time with your families, probably doing a lot of cooking, a lot of big meals. Uh, I know, you know last couple of weeks I've done a lot of cooking for the family, and they've done a lot of cooking for me. Uh, if you want to just get back to some normalcy, just find it easy to, to cook something and, and get, it, get it quickly and on the run. 
Uh, go check out primeshrimp.com, uh, one of our great sponsors. Uh, it's simple. You pick from all the different flavors that they have, and they have the brand new New Orleans style barbecue shrimp pack. Um, but you just boil some water, you put it in there less than 10 minutes. There's uh, no thaw, no mess, no fuss. Restaurant quality results at home uh, in, in that amount of time, 10 minutes or less. You can cook up some pasta with it, some rice, whatever you want to do. Just really, I know this time of year, it's just nice to have an easy, quick, you know, uh, delicious meal prepared for you uh, at home without all the mess and the fuss. So go check them out, P-R-I-M-E, shrimp.com. Use the, your promo code Sooner Scoop. You'll get $20 off your first order, uh, and you can order. You can try the New Orleans-style barbecue shrimp pack. Also, uh, all their other great flavors like, like the uh, – uh, French Quarter Alfredo, the uh, Garlic Herb and Butter, the Signature Seasoned Cajun Shrimp Pack, also the Lemon and Cracked Peppers. So go check them out, primeshrimp.com. Use that promo code Sooner Scoop. Get $20 off your first order. All right, so here's the, here's the really scary part. If you guys do leave Orlando, coming in behind you is one Josh McQuistion who already has tickets to on a Southwest flight for like months now to go see the Under Armour practices. Yeah, I, I have that to look forward to. And again, everything I'm reading and hearing, I keep thinking like, oh, tomorrow will be the day things They'll will get start it all to sorted out. out. Yeah. And every day it's just more of a shit show from Southwest. And it's, I, and I hate it because Southwest in Houston, for those that don't know, there's two airports. One's very convenient. One is very not for where I live and is enormous anyway uh iah george bush up in north houston and hobby is closer to my house and it's very easy and you know you just in and out and you and i and i know southwest i fly it i know all the drills of the airport i know where i want to park everything like that um but i have booked other arrangements and am not super excited about it um but you know, we got to go. There's like eight guys uh, in, o in OU's class that are going to be at the Under Armour. So we just kind of can't afford to miss that. And so I've had to make some alternative options. Now, I will say I still haven't canceled my Southwest flight because I'm, I'm still holding out hope that that much, much cheaper flying option is available to me. Dave, I mean, it's just it's they've cost people so much, but I, I'll say. You know, I do radio in the mornings with Curtis Fitzpatrick. His family flew southwest to New York, and uh, they were there. Uh, they were going to fly back on Christmas Day and, and have the kids get presents and stuff. Well, they got stuck, uh, and the, the guy at the rental counter told them that they're only renting cars to people that return them to the airport. But his rental agent was kind enough to tell him, yeah, just tell us that's what you're doing, and here in a couple hours— call the reservation line and tell them you're going to take it somewhere else. And so he drove from New York to Oklahoma City in a, I want to say it was like a Chevy Malibu with his entire family. His daughter got sick and threw up in the back um, on the way, and, and uh, apparently puke freezes really fast. But um, it cost them over $1,700 just to rent that car. <laughs> that that's insane. that is insane uh guys talk about so yourself. how long did it take them to go across hold like on. was it like uh, two two three days hold on uh just a second talk amongst yourselves all right well guys um i, I guess for me uh as far as like I, I haven't had a chance to watch all of it but just watching the staff and you know kind of brent go through his stuff I mean, is there a vibe about the team? Like, or is it kind of like, I mean, do they seem to carry our sentiment that this is going to be a bit of a shit show? I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in between. Yep. I, I, yeah. What do you think? Like, I think it's one of those things. It's like, they're happy to be here. Everybody loves being around each other for another week. Uh, they're going to try their best. But at the end of the day, I just don't know if they have enough horses. Like, I, right. I truly just don't know if they have enough to be or enough answers to be able to come up and beat what I think is a pretty damn good football team. Like if, if they can rally the troops and if they're able to be com super competitive on a, a Thursday night, I, I not like, I'm not going to be making any grand statements about it, but I think that that is a major, major positive for the direction of the program, even in a losing effort, if they're able to just go out there and play well, uh, but 
like they they've played well at times this year. It's just every time that they were able to get momentum within a game, every time that they were given an opportunity to go win a football game, they didn't do it. And for that to change over the course of a month, and now you're down five, you know, basically five starters, uh, you know, even a sixth if you want to throw in Theo Weiss, I it just like I I have a hard time thinking that it's all going to come together if I'm being realistic about this situation. And, and what people have to remember, OU didn't earn its way into this bowl game. They got picked because of the brand. Like, this was an uneven matchup to begin with because Florida State should be playing, what, like Texas Tech probably? Like, if, if you actually based it upon the standings and how things worked out and the way yeah. that, that, that it should have went. So, OU shouldn't be here. And there's down starters. And, it, and so it's just like, what what could you possibly expect them to be able to do? Now, it, as Eddie has said, it's very clear this team enjoys being around each other. Like, they, they've said it repeatedly. Sure. I think we've been around them enough. Like, we weren't around the last two years because of COVID, so we couldn't really get a feel of the, com- the camaraderie. Like, was there real chemistry or, like, was there – division you know was was it fractured as you know the way brent phrased it when talking about when he arrived here last year but we can say that this team is not fractured they're they're just not as good as what everyone was hoping for but they're still playing hard for each other and that'll be the case thursday and it's just the fact of the matter is that even with those five guys it was going to be a up a real uphill climb and that without them, it, they're just going to need some incredible breaks to go their way. You know, it's like you can't play even, just like an even game with Florida State. You need them to you know, drop a couple turnovers deep in your territory, something on special teams. Like just whatever fluke plays that can happen in a the game, they all need to go in your favor. All right, sorry, yeah. sorry, and, guys. Uh, mailman had come, and I had to make sure. I, I can't let the uh, Sooner Scoop store drop down just because Eddie's stuck in Orlando right now. So I had to get <laughs> a few right. things out. Right. That's right. No, but I mean, you know, the momentum of this recruiting class. Yeah, you just have to. You just have to. You know, play a respectable game. And uh, you know, yep. I think they're going to be fans. They're going to be mad that you know they finished six and seven. But I think I think if they go out there and just don't embarrass themselves. Uh, which I don't think they will. I mean, as long as Dylan Gabriel's playing, I mean, you know, it's it's somebody I don't tried think to Florida State defensively is just a bunch of world beaters. No. Like if they can get into a shootout, you just have to trust that they're not going to make the mistakes that they made repeatedly, uh, especially late in games. And if if you can avoid that, uh, you know, pre snap penalties, turnovers, uh, drop passes, missed blocks, things like that. I mean, a whole lot. <laughs> it, yeah, like it, it, they, they're six and six for a reason. Yeah, it but I mean, you look guys, at the, look at the way the season played out, though. I mean, you beat Iowa State. Uh, you you lose by three to Baylor. You know, you you lose by three to West Virginia, which never should have happened. Uh, you beat Oklahoma State. You, then you lose by three to Tech. I mean, it's not like this team was getting their heads kicked in down the stretch. No, that, but but they were zero and four in every game that. Uh, was a one, one possession game. Yeah, like they exactly. they didn't win a single one win. possession game that they needed to, which I think is like the most surprising thing about it because that's what they had done for the last three or four years in every, you know in late game situations when they needed to make a play, especially on the offensive side of the football, they were able to do so. It's not like they well, don't we know can... how to win. It's not 1999 again. Yeah, while we can absolutely count on this team. I mean, from all that we've seen to make catastrophic mistakes, they also don't let anybody run away from them other than Texas and TCU when the Texas one, again, is almost like an exhibition game when you look back on it. But the, you know, with those exceptions, they played everybody tough. Like they were there in every game. In some of the games, it was them that let people hang around. Like they let people back into games. You know, Texas Tech, that game was in hand and Oklahoma just, let it fall away in like five minutes of the second quarter. Um, so to me, I, I feel like Oklahoma winning is more likely than Oklahoma getting blown out. Like I, I, I just, I don't see that because I don't think the Florida state defense is anything special. And I think Oklahoma has weapons that can take advantage of them. Now, 
they've got a block. I mean, to me, that, that's that's the whole question. If Oklahoma has any chance, can they slow down Florida State up front? Yeah, I mean, they're gonna need they're gonna need big games from guys like Jordan Kelly. They're gonna need I don't know, you know, what they're gonna do um, in terms of new guys. I mean, Eddie, you talked about seeing Marcus Stripling playing inside. Um, yeah, he was back with the D. He, he was back with the end. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they gave that a look and they're like, nah, nah, not going to work. Um, but, yeah. Sadly, I mean, I'm kind of like. Grayson Holton, I mean, going to be a, a pass. It's like, I, I think you know what's going to happen. Yeah, but I mean, it's going to be, you talked about the young guys. It's going to be interesting to see what, you know, Grayson Holt can do from a, a, a game beginning to end standpoint because you know he's going to be a bigger factor than he's been all year. Yeah. But, I mean, that's the thing with, I mean, with I, this team and, and why they haven't been able to hold on the leads and haven't been able to play complimentary football is a lot of it is on that defensive line. Losing the edge, you know, just, just not making plays, not getting after the quarterback. So, I, I you know, I think I think a guy like Lualu, 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 Lualu I, I still don't know how to say it. Like, Lualu. He he's a yep. guy that you know could be a difference maker for him, and he has been at times. So, is it fair to say people should be more worried about the offensive line than the defensive line, though? Yes, because if they're going to have any chance, I mean, Dylan Gabriel is going to have to stand up right, and you have three starters out on the offensive line. I mean, straight up, you have three starters. Does Florida State have and two tackles, s- scary edge guys. Because that's, they I mean, verse. let's face it, you, you've you got, essentially, you're set, you're settled at the interior. It's, you know, your your tackles, can they handle it? Yeah. Tyler Guyton and Jacob Sexton, who's going to be getting his first start on Thursday night, uh, you know, they're going to have to play really, really well. I You know, I, I think that, you know, Tyler Guyton's obviously played a little bit. I think there's a lot of people that feel like his future is extremely bright. Uh, same can be said for Jacob Sexton, but... Same time, I'm, he's being thrown into a, kind of a tough spot. Starting in a bowl game as a freshman is is a pretty tough, tough ask. Yeah, like I said, I mean, there's so much about this matchup that does not look good for Oklahoma. But if it it feels like there are big plays there to be had, and again. I keep coming back, and I know I know I'm not the first one to have this conversation, but I keep coming back to the fact that Florida State's, you know, like you look at the schedule, they've not done anything special. Like you look at who they've beaten, they escaped against a bad Florida team. I mean, like you look at the three ranked teams, or their three losses on the schedule, and one of them was Wake Forest at home. Like I, I yeah. do I, I mean. Don't get me wrong. Florida State should win this game, and I think they're probably seven to ten points better than this version of Oklahoma. But the pieces we've seen from Oklahoma at various points in the year, they can beat this Florida State team. They they can. I just I, I think you'd be crazy to to believe it's going to happen with all that we've seen this year. Yeah, I think nine and a half is a number that I I, I wouldn't feel comfortable laying that down. For Florida State. I mean, they, they could certainly get that number, but I don't know. I I, I feel like it, a, a, a moderately competitive game is un, upon us. Yeah. Unless the offensive about, line just totally sucks. Unless the so. offensive line just totally sucks and Javante Barnes uh, fumbles a lot. I mean, yeah, they can't get the running game going at all. But I don't think that's going to happen. To me, Javante Barnes is the one guy I think could really kind of put his stamp on that position on his on his job going into next season. Absolutely. And and guys, there's a case to be made that they're better at right tackle than with Guyton than they are with Morris. Like that that's a reasonable conversation to have. So now, while left tackle, obviously, huge change. You're losing a potential first round guy and replacing him with a true freshman. That is a massive ask of Jacob Sexton. If that, if that's the way it goes, I know Aaron Parks is, you know, kind of part of that conversation as well, but I think we all expect it to be Jacob Sexton. So that's, that's huge. And I, I don't know how you fix that hole, but there's a lot of experience at the other four positions. I mean, Guyton's played a lot of football this year and the other three guys have played a ton of football period. 
By the way, I want to remind you guys, uh, deadsoxy.com, we've uh, submitted uh, the graphic for the unofficial 40 socks, so that should be coming uh, in the next couple of months, hopefully. And uh, you can go right now, use the promo code SCOOP, and get 25% off uh, and free shipping on all orders, so your entire order. Uh, just go to deadsoxy.com, D-E-A-D-S-O-X-Y.com. Uh, get the, uh, the no-shows, get yourself some of the boardrooms, uh, get yourself the uh, crimson uh, and cream uh, pack to uh, wear to game days. Uh, and uh, just just a great company, great socks. Uh, we've all worn them. Uh, everybody that I know that's got them from uh, hearing about them on the podcast says that they love them. So go check them out, deadsoxy.com. Use that promo code SCOOP and get 25% off uh, your entire order. All right. Um, you know, outside of all of that, uh, you know, the recruiting class, you know, Obviously, very good based on a six and six season, and you know I, I know I've seen some stuff from Miguel Chavis and uh, you know others that you know kind of saying, "Hey, it's twenty twenty four is time here." Um, but I, you know, being in Orlando is probably not the worst thing for recruiting, just because you have the Under Armour there and you have so many recruits or so many signees that are going to be playing in that game. Josh, it's to me, it's it, it's a real signal, and and you just look at the rankings, but. It's a signal that that Oklahoma is still, you know, a recruiting superpower even with a down season. Oh yeah, I mean, you look at what they've got. I mean, I, I was kind of working with somebody trying to find out some of the the arrival information. Um, and, I mean, you look at an Under Armour, PJ Adabari, Jackson Arnold, Peyton Bowen, Lewis Carter, Caden Green, Jacoby Johnson, Jaquez Petaway, and Derek LeBlanc would be in the game if, if he wasn't, you know, like we've talked about earlier, already part of, uh, you know, taking part in no use practices and things. So there is, um, there's a lot. Ha- I mean, that's seven guys that are going to be part of this game. And really, frankly, I mean, the three, five, well, the two five stars in the class and PJ Adabari right there on the fringe, Caden Green as well. So it, it's um it is it's a good statement of where Oklahoma is, and it never hurts to be in Orlando because I mean you know you you get these you get a lot of eyeballs from an area that Oklahoma recruits a ton. Um, obviously that's that's Derek LeBlanc's basically his hometown, so you get a lot of easy connections there, and you get uh, a lot of. Tampa, Orlando talent that's, you know, when they're, whether it's them or their parents are watching the news at night, they see, you know, oh, everybody's gearing up for, I mean, probably not the cheese at bowl, but hey, there probably is some mention of Oklahoma and Florida State, obviously with Florida State being such a pivotal part of that area. I also wonder, I don't know the answer to this, but can like Jackson Arnold go to the game and be on the sideline? I don't think he can be on the sideline, but he can, right. I mean, obviously he can, you know, he can go buy a ticket, go to the buy game. I'm sure he that. probably will. Um, you know, cause that, that's the thing. Like, and I mean, I don't know if Eddie and Bob have started to notice it, but every year when I'm down there for Under Armour, you see like, you know, like I think it was two years ago, Penn state played down there. I think in the, um, Oh, maybe the Gator bowl. I can't, I, it, it, it was some, the citrus, yeah. citrus. Yeah. And I mean, just hundreds of Penn State fans. Like I mean, like it it all just intertwines. Like it's all right there together because they all are doing the same stuff and they're all in the same hotels. It, it's very commingled. It's not such a big city that everybody's kind of off doing their own things. Everybody's together, and you see signage for everything when you're around Orlando. Um, but yeah, no, I, like I said. I don't think he can be there based on the contact situation, even though he signed. Um, I know there is an opening, like a quiet period that changes things a little bit. Now that's like, but I don't think that's like January 2nd or something. So um, I don't think he can have any direct contact with the staff while he's there. So we, yeah. And let's explain kind of how it all works. Like what's the game day uh, for that, I know the practices will start when you'll go down. Uh, media day actually happens some of it the day that OU plays. Uh, but, mm-hmm. like, what's the schedule? What do you kind of get out of that? And, and, and when is that game? Sure, sure. So, the, um, the all the players start to arrive on Thursday, uh, December 29th. Uh, yeah, December 29th. And they'll come in all sorts of various times. I've been there. 
I've flown in at like 7 a.m. and gotten over that media room and then sat there for like five hours waiting for the first OU, you know, related guys to show up. So that's always a little bit of a cluster. And obviously with all we've talked, we've had a lot of travel talk in this podcast. And I would expect, I mean, there's a lot, you know, guys, you're just talking about the list there. I mean, you've got guys coming in from Kansas City, guys coming in from Dallas, uh, you know, all these places so they could be coming in at any time because God knows what their travel looks like. Uh, and then you throw in a guy like Lewis Carter, who's just making the drive over from Tampa. Like what, what is he, you know, what's he going to do? So, um, or, you know, when does he arrive? But then they'll have that day. Like I said, it's just media days. And then they go through, you know, basic meetings and stuff like that the night before. And then the following night, which will be Friday, the 30th, they'll have their first practice, which is that evening over on um, the wide world of sports there on, uh, on Disney's campus. And I'll, I'll be there for that. I'll go through the first practice. And that's usually the one I'm there for. I usually do media day and that first night practice, but I always kind of hate what I get. Like as far as video and pictures, like it's never good. Cause it's really dark. You'd think a Disney production, it would be really well lit. And it's just, it's not. So the following day, I'm going to stay around for an afternoon practice, catch all that, and then I, I will head back. But So we should have pictures, video, hoping to speak to all the guys, uh, do interviews with all of them, and just kind of you know catch up and get a little bit of a feel for what that's like as those guys go through it. And you know most of these guys, I mean, you talk about it, Atabari, Arnold, Bowen, uh, Green, and Petaway, I, I, I think are – no, excuse me, not Petaway – um, and I can't remember if Jacoby Johnson's an early enrollee or not. I'm trying to pull up my list real quick. Um, I don't believe no, he's not. So. Of course he's not. Cause he's playing basketball. No. He's playing basketball. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, five or six of these guys, this is their last real high school moment. I mean, they're, they're going to do this and then just move on to, uh, to Oklahoma in a couple of weeks. So it's kind of always interesting to have those conversations and just, you know, see what their kind of final thoughts are. Cause we won't get to talk to them again for a little while. Yeah. I'm just looking the, uh, yeah. Five o'clock. I don't know if that's central or Eastern. I think that's Eastern. So it should be what four o'clock on Tuesday, January 3rd on ESPN. Yes. Yes. I think, I think that time is central because four, I mean, four central on January 3rd would be kind of like on a Tuesday would be kind of weird, yeah. but, um, it's possible, but I, I don't know that for sure. Sorry. I know you asked me about the date and I forgot to list that part. I tried to get you, um, yeah, pick you up. Yeah. You know, all this money you're spending right now. Oh I know it's stressful. yeah. I mean, I currently have two flights to Orlando. No, not a lot of people can say that. Eddie and Bob have two flights to Oklahoma City. <laughs> I think I know which one they're going to use. It's not going to be the Southwest one. I mean, do you guys do you guys want to live dangerously and just keep the Southwest? We'll cancel the other and just go for it. After all you've been through, it seems like that's you know well worth your time to uh, live live that risk. Eddie would bring that car, that rental car, back looking like when uh, Cole Trickle and. Rowdy Gaines <laughs> went to go eat dinner together. That's what that car would look like. I believe one of those was a Malibu. It's our second Malibu reference of the podcast. So, yeah. Um, yo, outside of that, uh, I noticed, uh, yo, Texas coming up for Oklahoma and basketball. Bob, that's, uh, that's a big one. It is. Uh, that'll be you know, New Year's Eve at one. We'll, we're gonna do a zo Zoom call with Porter Moser tomorrow because I, I just I don't think we'll all be back in town in time Friday for do something in person. So we're gonna do a Zoom probably from Camping World Stadium to talk to Porter about getting ready for the Horns and just what's he thought about what the Big Twelve was able to accomplish in the non-conference. I'm sure it doesn't surprise him. But, man, it's good. just like it is every single year. It is going to be one heck of a grind to try to make the tournament. And they're going to have to do some work in conference because they did not move the needle this year whatsoever based on the wins they had during the non-conference non portion. Guessing Chris Beard won't be back no matter how many people try and drop charges. 
that that'll be interesting. You know, will that eventually catch up to the horns? Uh, you know, it almost did that one game against Rice, and they were able to get through that. And then they've been you know smooth sailing in every other game. You know, can OU be the first team to really attack the fact that no one knows what the heck's going to be happening with Beard throughout the rest of the season? You know, first first game of conference. Can can you jump on them early? and get that win under your belt, have that in your bag as you go throughout the rest of the season. And we'll try and figure out uh, exactly how the post game is going to work. I mean, maybe the fact that this game starts at 430 will allow us to do something uh, the night at the night of the game. So Eddie and I will kind of work that out as we go along. I'm not sure if we still have Eddie with us or not. No, I'm okay. here. Okay, you're there. there. All right. Yeah, I'm here. So, so yeah, we'll I'm have our uh, final... Eskridge Lexus uh, post game uh, after the game. At some point, we'll figure it out with all the everything that's going on. So, I would just Kinda say, crazy. Josh, I, just real quick, Josh, I know that you put some stuff in woke uh, just as far as transfer portal stuff. It's going to be interesting. Uh, Brent said something today uh, at the joint press conference, uh, and I, I don't think that it was necessarily any type of breaking news, but talking about thirty-five new faces. Is in the program that would be on top of the uh, you know the guys that they obviously just signed, but it seems like they're still going to continue to be active in that in that regard. And you know, obviously, Trace Ford and what his decision is going to be coming up. It should be kind of interesting to watch there. Well, and I think some of what Woke talked about, without getting into too much of it, is there's at least one guy that a lot of people had connected to Oklahoma that I don't think Oklahoma is going to have room for. And it's not because Oklahoma doesn't want him. But there, and again, to kind of further, uh, you know, another storyline that I think is interesting in it is there was some talk of kind of an NIL balance, like using the NIL rather than having the, you know, the scholarship to give. And the player that I'm talking about doesn't really want to do that from everything I've gathered, but it does speak to Oklahoma. While not perfect in that arena, they're trying to get their ducks in a row. They're starting to use that avenue to do, you know, more um, intricate things and, and not just, oh, you know, we got to get this this player handled or this recruit. Like, they're trying to use it in various ways, and I think that's interesting. But again, the it, it, what it speaks to in a bigger picture to me is that Oklahoma doesn't think they have that many spots. Like, they clearly have some, you know, they think some of these fifth-year guys or some of these guys that still have the COVID year available are going to come back. They think there's some of that potential. So there is, um, I don't think, you know, I've seen some people saying like, oh, they could get 10 or 12 guys out of the portal. As I look at it, I don't know that that's going to be right. Like it, it may be five to seven, somewhere in that ballpark. But I don't think there's going to be this massive overhaul unless there are a couple of guys that enter the portal that are just no doubt these guys can help the roster kind of types. Oh, God. I'm just reading uh, Robert Allen's take on the Mike Gundy reporter debacle. Uh, that, uh, it, it's, it's the definition of the chef's kiss. That is, <laughs> it's, it's almost too good. I hope he wins a Pulitzer Prize for it. it. It's too on brand. I didn't know that could be a thing, but it's too perfect. I mean, it's at least worth a $25 gift card to uh, uh, Perkins in Stillwater. Uh, people, that's a question you have to ask, Mike Gundy. You, it's you, you a have f***ing to. softball question of all softball questions when it comes to hard questions. Just asking a guy. And he didn't even ask it aggressively. I thought no, he was overly, right. m- almost meek about it. He was and like, I don't you, have to, to you have to understand. He gave him an out. Yeah, you have to understand, Mike, because of all the things that have gone on that people are questioning if you're going to make any staff changes, are you? Like. My God. They just lost six of seven. Yeah, they started out six and one, finished seven and six. (laughs) To a school that fired their coach in midseason. They have a a quarterback who started there for four years that doesn't believe that the program is good enough to to highlight his skill set as much as it can. I mean, like, you can't f*** up more than that as an offense. Like, to have a guy that's in your system, that knows your system, that looks at it and says, yeah, I need to go somewhere else to reach my full potential. Like, nobody's been hard on him about that. Like, 
I watched that game last night from beginning to end, and the reporters that brought it up, they were like making it out like just taking Mike Gundy's his spin on it and putting it out there as national the national narrative. Like, I'm sorry, nobody's pressed him on this, but that is a massive failure of a coaching staff to lose your starting quarterback of four years to the transfer portal. And he's not even good enough to go to the NFL. Not to mention, who's probably the best quarterback in school history other than the head coach of himself. Or at least winning is. Well, yeah. I mean, crazy. Brand, I'd say Brandon Whedon, you know, is up there just because yeah, yeah, he won yeah. a big I, I championship. Yeah, Whedon was probably a better quarterback, right. but he also had better better tools But he wasn't. Him. He I didn't mean, have the longevity, right. Sure. Because there was like, better the, recruiting the, happening around him. 100%. And that's, that's part of the problem. They're 6-7, and seven be, or they went 7-6 and six and lost 6-7 six and seven because of depth. Well, who the fuck – I mean – who recruited those problems? Well, or lack there. They don't want to recruit. They don't want to worry about the portal. Yeah, they, they don't, don't want, want to talk ask, their like, players into coming back. I mean, what are you doing up there? Like, what what is yeah. it that's making all this money? And to call the guy an crazy, ass man. and ignorant for asking that question that was a more than legitimate fair question. Who and, also and not to mention, is, I think Marshall and, a, and those guys do a great job. They. I mean, they, they're literally, they're, their business is dedicated. It's like us. That be like it, It's good for them when they win. Like, he's not out to get anybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, none he of us. doesn't none suck of us. his dick like uh, Robert Allen does. Well, I mean, he's on the payroll, so, I mean, you got to realize exactly. that. Exactly. Like, it's, it's crazy to me. And, and that is the thing you do have to consider with those things. Like, there is a line that we can go across – that I, I, I would, if I was employed by OU, I would feel differently about. Like I understand that. That that's that's okay. Um, but at the same time, like you have to acknowledge it when things are like this, and just be like, you know what? I'm just gonna stay out of that game. I'm just not like I don't have to say something. I don't have to be a you know a a sunshine pumper. But at the same time, I can just not say anything. That's okay too. Um, uh, oh, I, I, like I, just, I said, I, I just it would have been on if a coach called me an ass for that question because then I would have taken the opportunity to earn that name that I was just called, <laughs> and I would point out because the whole Spencer Sanders deal, and I would point out the 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 whole you know losing coordinators. I would point out you know going starting six and one, finishing seven and six. I would point out their you know their inability to keep a running back or offensive line intact, like. That's all on the offense. There's if OSU fans, it's just like I say with OU fans all the time. They're not stupid. They can see that things are are screwed up on the offensive line, and they have been for years. They can see that they they start out with a running back, and they never finish with the running back because they don't pick the right ones when the season starts. Like that happens every year. It's just like there are massive, massive problems right now for Oklahoma State on the offensive side of the ball, and they've been lucky that their defense has covered up for them the last few years. Guys, and it's the same shit I said when everybody got mad about Dion being so direct with the players. This is not like – these are grown men. They know the game they're in. They know it's a results organization. They know that this business isn't about like, oh, we're going to protect the family. Stop. Stop with that. Like, no. Like, I, I get that in that question, he's not – nobody's expecting him to say, okay, we're going to fire the offensive coordinator and the receivers. Like, nobody's expecting that answer. You can do three things. You can give a real answer without itemizing your list, but you can say, yeah, you know, we do things weren't where they needed to be in certain aspects of our team. We're going to address those, you know, and you don't have to say somebody's going to be fired. Like we're going to address the problems. However, we feel is the best way to do so. You can give a non-answer that's like, oh, we want to worry about our seniors and we want to, you know, we're going to address that when the time's right. Or you can pivot to a non like just pivot to something like, oh, you know, like this is Oklahoma State football's, you know, more than one game. We don't want to be reactionary, blah, blah, blah. There's a million ways you can answer that question without being a shit heel to the kid or to the guy that asked the question. I sorry, I, I, the one I saw was O'Cauley. And so I keep thinking it was a college student, but I know it wasn't. Um, no, it was uh, the pistol firing I just, blog. Yeah. 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 And it just, it, it like, I don't even like because I get that it's a tough question. So 
if if Mike Gundy's going to come at me with a tough answer, okay, that, and, that's and, life. You know what else he did? He but waited till the, the end of the his credential. F- off with that stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to threaten your credential. I mean, that was the most. And and the guy did exactly what he does. And I tell young you know journalists this all the time. It's okay to ask that question. Wait till the end of a press conference to ask that question. Don't derail an entire, especially the last press conference of the year. And that's the thing. People are like, oh, it's not the place for it. That's exactly the place for it. It's the final press conference of the year. It's the final game of the year. You lost. You're going into an offseason. You don't know when you're going to talk to Mike Gundy again. It might be a month. So that's when you ask those questions. And I, I said this on Twitter. After that 2014, uh, when it was the Russell Athletic Bowl, I asked Josh McQuist, or Josh McQuist, Josh Heupel if he thought he would be returning to be the offensive coordinator next year. And it was uncomfortable. I didn't want to, you know, it, it wasn't pleasant. Didn't enjoy it. Didn't do it for shits and giggles. I did it because it needed to be asked to get his reaction. And his reaction was, I don't know, basically. And, and that I, let guys, you know. Guys, you heard Kerry threaten my job <laughs> like, on, on the podcast. So, I mean, like, I can take it. It's fine. Uh, I don't, I don't want to do this job if you're not around. <laughs> I'm going to fly to Orlando. Uh, uh, no, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, it was a huge mistake by Mike Gundy and the way he handled it. He made it a big deal when it didn't have to be. And that's the biggest mistake of all. Like, you're a head coach, you're getting paid millions of dollars. Just, just you know, you're not Kerry Murdoch sitting around fighting with people on Twitter. Like, yep. you, are, you, are the, the, you are the CEO of Oklahoma State football. Like you got to know that and, to 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 minimize it and just get that past you and, and give the answer like you said. And and the bottom moves line on. is, he answered it anyway. The way he answered it is like shit. People are getting fired. Like because if either or not, you just say you know no. Like we're happy with where we're at. Like you don't answer like that if it's all good. You know what the answer is. And I I just like I just don't know what he accomplished other than making. The reporter looked like the good guy, and him looked like an ass. Well, let's face it. I mean, like the whole, you know, people's livelihood and stuff like that. Like, we're talking about fan bases that boo players. Like Spencer Rattler got booed. Like he's not made, he wasn't making a million dollars. I mean, these coaches they get paid tens of millions of dollars to leave in some cases, which we all would I- love that. I'll take that. I need yeah. to be, I, I would love to be Auburn's head coach and get fired in two years. Oh, they could hate me like Brian Harson forever. <laughs> That's fine. Just just burn my pictures at Auburn and I will I'll be on an island somewhere. I won't even know what you're doing. So yeah, it was just stupid. I mean, I woke up to that this morning. I went to bed as soon as the game was over. But waking up to that, it was just like, oh my God, what have you done, Mike Gundy? You know, he's really you're, here's the, here's Mike Gundy. You know the perfect dis- description for Mike Gundy? He's a poor man's Kim Mulkey. He has oh, he, he has all he does all the same shit and, and it's petty and it's stupid and it doesn't need to be done, but he does it anyway. He just does it at a much less competent level. Not a bad comparison. Not a bad comparison. And they both want Brittany Griner to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And they and well, again, Kim Mulkey I mean, won't even Kim Mulkey won't even waste a breath. She's... Kim Mulkey won't even waste her breath to even d- d- acknowledge Brittany Griner anymore. Yeah, yeah, he's a poor man's mm-hmm. Kim Mulkey. Congratulations, Mike Gundy! What an aspirational achievement. Beautiful. All right, uh, well, guys, looking forward to uh, the coverage has been great. Uh, the travel is not. I'm glad you guys are there, and uh, we'll hope to get you guys back home after this thing is over. Hopefully, it's not a shit show. Josh, we'll, uh, I don't know, we need to make like a, you're not Catholic, so like Eddie would have to come here and like make, what do you call that, like an altar where you light the candles? I mean, the only time we've ever seen Eddie host a religious experience, someone had died, so I don't know that I want Eddie leading anything like that. I think. I think Jeff Ketchum is back to life. Is he not, Eddie? Did he? Did he? Was he resurrected? He's back. We might have to end up staying with him in Austin if uh, if we <laughs> make it through. Your, your <laughs> connecting flight is through Austin. I saw stories uh, from the uh, the Statesman yesterday. There, that's a shit show there too. 
yeah, it's uh, it's not great. It's not great. Don't worry, we're 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 emptying our bank accounts to make sure you have another flight home. So, oh, all we'll, right, we'll be good. I think we'll be good. Well, looking forward to it uh, tomorrow, four thirty, uh, kickoff on ESPN, Florida State, Oklahoma. All the media is over, so now it is time for you guys to go find the hospital. Has the hospitality room any good there? Haven't been up there once. Don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's we open, haven't been up there. It's only open at night, but it wasn't open yesterday because of Top Golf was the media party, so they didn't have the room op- the room open. Interesting. Did either of you partake in Top Golf? We did. We went over there for a second. We went for an hour. Well, good. I'm glad you're finding it's some. It's a pretty light media contingent. Yeah, there's not exactly a whole bunch of OU media here yet. Yeah, I think I want. I'm, has there been any word if Trammell's going to even be able to get out there? Because he was doing the he's trying to tomorrow. He was doing the I'm coming out on Wednesday. Oh yeah, today he's trying to today. We'll see. I think now, we're every, all, now, uh, waiting. Everyone that's coming out today is not on uh, Southwest. So that's why no one's nearly as worried for Bailey, Chapman, Barry. Okay. They're all they're they're not flying south on uh, Southwest. They're all smart enough to switch. I just want to know if we're gonna get our money back. That's all I really care about, which probably won't. So uh class action, I'm gonna double up on Camp Lejeune and Southwest class action lawsuits. Pay for yeah, you might need to. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us. We'll be back again next week. Uh, big season wrap-up edition of the Unofficial 40 Podcast. We'll have more from Josh's time in Orlando at the All-American Game. Looking forward to seeing that on television. And Jackson Arnold and all the other OU, Peyton Bowen, all the other OU guys that are going to be in that one. So uh, thank you for listening. We'll be back again uh, in another week for next edition of the Unofficial 40 Podcast from Soonerscoop.com.